Thank you so much, Lily, for that amazing introduction. Um, this is, um, it's really great to be here. I actually gave a version of this talk a year ago um, to Lily's group, the Feminist Labor Lab, um, and it really helped um, shape a lot of the ideas that I'm gonna talk about today. I really sincerely say that meeting Lily as an undergrad in computer engineering completely changed my trajectory for what I did, and I'm forever thankful for that and for her continued mentorship. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, designing social, social systems that support collective action and community accountability. And mostly what I'm going to focus on is sort of how can we shift our focus in the design of socio-technical systems that will help us sort of enable us to imagine alternative ways for these systems to work. And the main thing, the main shift that I'm going to talk about today is from a focus on content, information, and engagement in social system design to a focus on people and their social relations. And I'm gonna show you through three projects um, how systems can help collectives build networks um, of familiarity and trust, how human labor can help move collective efforts forward when they stall, and how we can support online communities to practice justice and accountability. So I'd like to start the talk with a vignette from um, an effort that shows the depths of the kinds of problems that we're dealing with here. And it has to do with harassment on Twitter. So this includes things like um, death and rape threats that are unfortunately very common and are frequently used in a concerted way to silence people online. And this is an issue that many people have very strong feelings about and they are determined to take action on. For instance, there is a change.org petition asking to shut down accounts that tweet threats and it has almost 400,000 signatures so far. And in 2017, um, the actress Rose McGowan spoke out for the first time about Harvey Weinstein's sexual harassment on Twitter. And her account was subsequently suspended from Twitter. Um, this caused a lot of outrage because a lot of people um, felt like there's a lot of hate speech on this platform that even when we report it, it goes unchecked. And then someone who's coming out and actually speaking out against harassment is the one who's getting shut down. Um, and so in response to this, people wanted to do something together. Um, a couple people tried to organize a boycott. So they chose a hashtag. It was hashtag women boycott Twitter. Um, they picked a date and they broadcast it through quite a number of high profile celebrities on Twitter. But the effort itself was actually quite controversial. Um, there were people who boycotted the boycott. Um, there were people who made counter hashtags, um, such as women of color affirmation. Um, Twitter promised that it was gonna make changes to its policies, but ultimately they said that they have limited resources and the whole effort fizzled. And the question of why and how can we move beyond that is sort of central to this talk. And I'm gonna argue that there were three main reasons. The first was that there was a lack of trust in the action. Um, so especially among women of color or trans women who felt like they were all of a sudden expected to show up and uh, participate in a boycott where they had not received similar support when they had spoken out about their issues. So one person said, if this is the event that activated your awareness, I don't particularly trust you. The second reason was that the effort stalled because there was friction within potential supporters of the effort about whether a boycott was um, even an appropriate way to protest the silencing of women. Um, some people were upset because they felt like the whole effort had settled too quickly on um, sort of a, an act of protest that was relatively easy messaging um, rather than something that would be more inconvenient or disruptive uh, means of resistance. And many women, especially women of color, felt like um, the protest that mandated their silence was actually quite ironic, um, if not outright misguided. Um, so one person said, it takes a certain amount of social power to believe that your absence will be remarked upon or lamented. And finally, the design of the platform itself makes targeted harassment and abuse really easy for people who do speak out about these issues. And there are very limited means for recourse. So I'm gonna argue that these are the three main problems um, that I'm gonna talk about today when, act, when um, collectives try to act online together. And moving beyond these problems actually requires collectives to um, have established trust and familiarity and accountability among themselves. But instead, rather than build um, what we need, our existing social infrastructure is designed around these um, atomic fast-paced interactions. Um, it's focused on providing infrastructure for hosting content and increasing engagement metrics around that content. 
So my main goal in this talk today is going to be to design alternative environments that scaffold and guide social interactions toward forming networks and working together on, on complex problems that we face. So how are we going to do that? I'm going to show you through three projects um, how we can shift from a focus on content and engagement to a focus on people and their relationships and what that can mean. The first step, um, or the first project I'm going to talk about, is about bringing people together to build those networks of familiarity. So we want to encourage people to talk to the same small group of people over time so that they start building familiarity and getting to know each other. At the same time, we want to balance this with reaching out and having conversations with new people um, who bring pr diverse perspectives and enable networks to form. And that's the goal of my first project, Hive, uh, which I did in part with accessibility advocates on Mozilla. But even when you have that, even when you have those networks of people who know each other, efforts can still get stuck, um, as we saw in a project uh, where we worked on designing structured human support to move efforts forward when they stall. Um, and I did this um, project called Dynamo as a collaborative effort with worker rights advocates on Amazon Mechanical Turk. And finally, inevitably, things go wrong and people do harm each other. And I've worked on how restorative and transformative justice can be used as frameworks for designing for um, justice and accountability online. So through these three projects, I want to convince you that if we pay particular attention to a collective's relationships of trust and accountability, we can design social computing systems that assist that collective in acting together. So first I'll talk about Hive. Um, and here we're thinking about very early stages of a collective action. You have a group of people, they have some sort of a shared uh, problem or uh, something that they want to work on, but they don't know each other yet. And they're doing the work of deliberation, just trying to understand and articulate the problem and collectively imagine goals and paths forward. And this is work I did with Michael Bernstein, Rosanna Ardila at Mozilla, and volunteers who participated online. And I designed a method called network rotation, which is a computational method that organizes conversation. So basically it balances um, how strong people's ties are to the people they're talking to at a specific moment with how strongly tight the overall conversation network is. So what we're trying to do with the system is get people to share their ideas, but also be exposed to different types of ideas um, and uh, while keeping the psychological safety of each individual group high. So we don't want a condition where you're constantly talking to new people and you don't get to actually engage deeply with anyone. We also don't want a condition where you're always talking to the same group of people over and over. So imagine that you have a big problem, like the one we just talked about with harassment on Twitter. And you have a lot of people who care deeply about that problem. The way our current social computing infrastructure works is that each person comes forward and they say the first thing that comes to their mind about that problem. So one person might say, um, we should all boycott Twitter for a day. Um, and someone else should think, actually, we should all share our stories for a day. And another person might want to create a list of all the harassers and records of their abuse. And these ideas are often very different and they're not very good by themselves because they often fail to incorporate other people's viewpoints, experiences, and constraints. And because of this drawback, HCI literature has actually looked into different ways to encourage people to engage with each other and basically intermix their ideas. And usually the way this works is that you have a big gallery or a map of everyone's ideas and you go to the person who came up with the boycott idea and you say, Here's another idea, recording abuse, um, intermix these two. Usually what happens in practice is that the person who came up with the boycott idea will come back and say, no, my idea was better. And the reason for this, drawing on research and communication theory and organizational behavior is that in the real world, just being exposed to other people's ideas doesn't actually influence <coughs> us that much. And we're much more influenced by other people when we, and their viewpoints when we talk to them because knowledge is situated and it's developed in the context of these social relations. So instead of intermixing people, um, I propose to intermix, instead of intermixing ideas, I propose to intermix people. <gasps> Um, there was one famous study where researchers showed that when they gave a real-world team working on a creative problem, ideas, a, a piece of paper with ideas from another team working on the exact same problem, it didn't influence them at all. They just ignored the ideas. But when they brought a person over from the other team, it actually influenced them a lot and it significantly improved their work. 
So my argument is that engaging in conversations with people can actually lead us to better ideas that dig deeper into the problem. And this is the insight that Hive, um, a system I built, is based on. Um, but we want to make this possible at the scale of a big network. And that's uh, where my... Um, my uh, uh, contribution network rotation comes in. So network rotation is basically a computational method. It says instead of having everyone talk to everyone at the same time, which basically doesn't work, it's going to divide people into teams um, and it's iteratively going to weave people together from distant parts of this collaboration network. And this is going to facilitate the spread of viewpoints within the collective. Now there are many, many different ways to reorganize a network. Um, and we want to do this in a good way, um, in an effective way. So the first question that we need to ask is what are the conditions for um, an effective network rotation? Uh, one of the more important ones is familiarity of psychological safety that's been shown a lot. When you talk to people who um, you know and you trust, you're, you engage deeper, you take risks, more risks together. And so one of the things that we definitely want is for people to be able to engage with people they know. The other thing is that we also know engaging with diverse perspectives really helps. Um, so in this project, I hypothesized that balancing these two needs would be more effective than strategizing to maximize either. Um, and that's what Hive, the computational system, does. Um, it balances familiarity, which we measured as tie strength between two people, which was basically how many days have they spent together in the same team, um, with network efficiency, which is a metric, a metric of a network which shows basically how tightly knit is this network, or is it um, a network that has lots of silos and people are sort of dispersed in their own uh, islands, or is it a network that's more tightly knit to each other? Now, I'm not going to get into the um, technical implementation specifics in this talk, for lack of time, but I encourage you to read it in the paper if you're interested. So we did two deployments to see whether Hive actually works. Um, the first one, we wanted to see, basically Hive is supposed to organize conversations that lead to more effective collective or collaborative work. Um, and first we wanted to see if we control for as much as we can, um, and we run an experiment that isolates the effect of network rotation, is this actually good? So we did that, we ran an experiment with three conditions. In one condition we had teams working in static teams, um, in another we had um, maximizing for network efficiency, so this was a condition where the algorithm was constantly moving people around trying to get a really um, well-connected network, and then we had the third condition, network rotation, which was our algorithm. Um, and what we found was that a network rotation actually improved over the baseline, but um, the other condition did not. So this suggests that it's not just the moves that enable better design teams, but it's also the structure of the overall network. So which moves do you actually do? So we showed in that experiment that network rotation is effective. But another question we had was, would people actually do this in the real world? Um, so we partnered with Mozilla's open innovation team. They um, issued an open call to their communities of volunteers and accessibility uh, enthusiasts and uh, asked them to participate in a week-long design drive for a problem that they had, which was reimagining a web, a web browsing experience that was accessible to more people. Um, we also reached out uh, to a couple communities that we know of people with disabilities and disability advocates, and Mozilla offered them a $150 gift card for lending their expertise to the project. And we added them as team leads, so each of the teams in this project had one of those team leads. Um, this was a week-long online effort. And surprisingly, it had very little attrition. So uh, out of the more than 100 people who signed up on the first day, six people overall dropped out. Um, people on average posted about 1,000 lines of chat a day, and they got really involved in it. Um, and to give you a sense of the kinds of proposals that teams came up with, in the end, I'll show you one. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, proposals that came out of this. Um, it was about ways of interacting with a computer that uh, are similar to sign language. So one member of this team actually had a new sign language and was talking about how in communities of people who sign, they're constantly reconfiguring gestures to mean new things. Um, and what are their ways to teach the computer these specific new gestures for frequent tasks, um, such as send an email to my friend for the gesture for that friend or save the document every time I nod my head. And one of the members of this team is actually in this room, Louise Hickman, who um, was an amazing addition to this work. Um, and I thank her very much. Um, so what did we learn from this? Uh, one of the things we learned is that membership change brought new perspectives, but it also added effort. So participants told us things like, 
The new members brought fresh perspectives um, and they allowed for more ideas to come into the room. One person said, meeting new pupils was great, mixing ideas was very helpful, especially as people dropped in and out later into the week. But while these fresh perspectives were exciting and helpful, people showed concern about losing out on the ties that they had already built with their teams. Um, so one person said, I liked bringing in fresh ideas every day. It gave a different or a new perspective, but sometimes you build good working relationships with others and you don't want to lose them. So this demonstrates the importance of balancing that building of tie strength and familiarity with um, uh, the overall structure of the network. And one way forward could be to give people more control over when they actually participate in these rotations. So uh, another thing that came out of this Mozilla deployment was that we found people relying on their own expertise and bringing them to the projects a lot. Um, and one, of the, one, of, one person who participated said, um, communication is a big one, a person with disabilities being able to communicate their needs and wants. My mother with dementia cannot communicate what she wants and can't answer a question you ask her. Her sense of comprehension is shot. Another person said, well, how do you fix that? Uh, and they responded, you don't. You learn to le read between the lines and act as best as you can to provide what they want. And we also found that the anonymity that this sort of an online environment provided for people to talk about these problems actually made them more comfortable to share their stories. Um, so in a way, by, by creating a new kind of environment that was based on these values, um, it created psychological safety. So one person who actually had disabilities and participated um, after one of the sessions said, wow, that didn't even feel like an hour. I'm lo loving this. This is stuff I never talk about. It's helping me realize some things about myself that I was blind to before I started talking about it here. Thank you all. So with Hive, I just demonstrated that it's possible to create environments for collectives to come together, build familiarity, and generate plans and proposals. And Hive was designed for groups who don't know each other yet, but have some sort of a shared interest. Dynamo, my second project, was actually, in contrast to that, designed for and by people who did know each other, um, and familiarity was, in a way, contributing to their problem. So to present Dynamo, I'm going to go back to the argument at the beginning that many collective efforts online never succeed, and why. And we already went through one of the reasons why that happens, which is a lack of trust and familiarity among the collective. But friction and disagreements can happen despite familiarity. And the collective that we worked with here, um, Amazon Mechanical Turk Workers, or Turkers, consisted of multiple tightly knit communities that had experienced disagreements and animosity in the past. And they even had a name for it in their community of practice. They called it Megadrama. <laughs> Dynamo, <laughs> Dynamo was about how can we support collective efforts despite these problems that inevitably come up. And these were highly context-dependent problems, so um, I took an ethnographic approach. I engaged with Amazon Mechanical Turk workers on these communities through a year of ethnographic fieldwork, where I deepened my understanding of their work environment, I would log on to their chat rooms every morning, and I learned about the challenges that they faced, but also built a working relationship with them. And then together we created a Dynamo. This was work with Lily, Ronnie, Michael Bernstein, Ali Al Khatib, Eva Ogba, Christy Millen, and Click Happier, and other volunteers who participated. I'm going to start talking about Dynamo by talking about the challenges of online work. So, what were these shared issues that Turkers wanted to act on? Then I'll talk about our effort to address them, Dynamo. And I'll explain the common failure scenarios that kept coming up. Um, and then I'll talk about the specific kinds of organizing and emotional labor that it took to move these efforts to success, what we called the labor of action. So first, what were the challenges? Um, researchers have argued that crowdsourcing platforms create what is basically computational infrastructure that makes crowd workers or people working on these platforms seem invisible. And as a result, a whole labor market has emerged online, sometimes it's called gig work, that leaves many workers struggling to find good work or to assert their rights when they're mistreated. And in response to these conditions, Turkers have formed collectives using very basic software, web forums or chat rooms that they use a lot and they use to share good work or to talk to their employers or even to raise money for a fellow Turker in need. And what I found in my ethnographic work was that forums were more effective at coordinating actions when the effort itself was not controversial and when individual actions still had an effect. For instance, raising money for someone, your $5 is still $5, regardless of whether other people pitch in or not. 
that they struggled more when the goal or how to get to it wasn't clear or when it required debate or many hands to share the burden. And what we found was that Turkers actually talked a lot about these issues, but they had trouble taking the next step. And this is basically essentially the same challenge as Twitter users facing friction over tactics and the disagreements causing the whole effort to fizzle. So how can we support an online collective, not just to discuss these um, complex issues, but to agree on common goals and execute them? And our effort to address this question was Dynamo. Our process for designing Dynamo was interactive and iterative. It involved almost 100 people overall. We began by engaging with Turkers on forums and publishing surveys on Mechanical Turk, and gradually as the work progressed, we had more people engaged um, in the process. And together we created an online platform that supports the Amazon Mechanical Turk community to form collectives around shared issues and mobilize. We launched Dynamo uh, on July 2014 and 532 Turkers registered on it. They submitted 22 ideas for action and two of them evolved into campaigns. And these campaigns took a lot of discussion and effort to actually launch. One of the longest discussion threads had 181 posts and 1,800 views. And that specific incident was actually triggered but when a well-meaning researcher um, injected false information into, into Turkopticon, which is a system that Lily built. Um, and this incident caused a lot of frustration, as you can imagine, because Turkers relied on the accuracy of the information on Turkopticon, which is sort of like a review system. It's, you can imagine it as the Yelp for requesters on Mechanical Turk. When this researcher injected false information, what their goal was, was to figure out what the effect of that false information was going to be on uh, people completing tasks for these different fake accounts that they'd made. But for Turkers, this was actually a really big deal because they relied on the accuracy of the information on Turkopticon for their jobs and for their livelihoods. And this incident caused a lot of frustration. Um, Turkers spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what had happened. Um, and at the end, they agreed that researchers lacked exposure to the kinds of issues and vulnerabilities they faced as Turkers. And this prompted them to want to write a set of publicly available ethical guidelines for research on Amazon Mechanical Turk and its communities. And they imagined that these guidelines could be both a means to guide ethical behavior, but to back Turker claims when things did go wrong. But there's a big gap from wanting ethical guidelines that we can all agree on to actually creating them. And I'm going to quickly go through the socio-technical infrastructure that we created this. So the infrastructure was based on um, a very low barrier to entry, so anyone can come and submit a short idea for an action that they want to take or a problem that they think exists. Other people can vote on ideas, so similar to Reddit. And once an idea gets 25 upvotes and has more upvotes than downvotes, it evolves into a campaign and officially launches. So by creating these ideas, voting on them, and discussing them, Dynamo supports collectives to form publics around shared issues and mobilize. And publics come together through their shared conditions and develop formulations and analyses of the issues that they face. And much of the research on publics has focused on these. What are the conditions for discourse and assembly? And we build heavily on that work, but also think about what are the conditions by which publics can successfully act together on shared issues. And when shifting from a space of deliberation to a space of action, Dynamo efforts almost failed multiple times. The most common failure scenarios that we saw were stalling and friction. And I'm going to argue that these are common pitfalls that any kind of online action can fall into. Because the same sort of decentralized characteristics that make it really easy for people to gather online also make it really easy to disperse. So it's actually really easy to, to walk into an online room, uh, throw a flame, and then back off and leave. So stalling, the first failure scenario that happened a lot, was when efforts lost momentum and stopped making progress. And usually that happened when the next steps were too difficult to identify or it was too much work for an individual to accomplish. So for instance, one effort on Dynamo was a letter writing campaign that stalled after weeks of discussion. Um, six circers had written their letters and shared them publicly on the internet. And the campaign organizer, who was actually a community manager on one of those Turker forums, contacted us and said, so it seems no one is interested. Um, a Turker just says we're doing it wrong, but won't say how to do it right, and no one else has input. 
But stalling was in many ways better than the alternative friction, which was when there was active criticism and negative emotion targeted at, at an effort's progress. So for instance, with the ethical guidelines effort that I mentioned, we were midway through when one Turker expressed disappointment about one specific paragraph in the guidelines that was technically not in compliance with Amazon's terms of service. So this is a paragraph that offered guidance about a specific kind of screen reading software that was technically against the terms of service, but a lot of requesters, especially in psychology studies, used it anyway. And this Turker was upset about why this specific paragraph existed and critiqued this position and, general, and had other general critiques because they felt like the document itself had gotten mired in technical detail when they imagined that it was supposed to be a high-level document of ethics. So stalling and friction are twin pitfalls um, that I'm going to argue are inherent challenges for online communities that act. To avoid stalling, members need to act. But acting can backfire if other people disagree with what you did. And we found that addressing friction reduces motivation in those getting critiqued, which causes stalling. So in other words, trying to fix one of these problems often leads to the other, and it seems like online collectives have far more reasons to fail at acting together than to succeed. When Dynamo actions faced these pitfalls, we actually stepped in, and we performed the kind of labor that was necessary to preserve the forward motion of the movement. And we called this the labor of action. So as issues came up on the Dynamo Forum, we worked to help people move past them. And gradually, we found that there were these common mechanisms that we kept using over and over. Uh, we drew them out and named them, and they can be transferred to other contexts as well. And my main contribution in this work is this labor of action, which includes particular kinds of emotional and cognitive labor. Um, and I'm going to argue that the mechanisms can be used to catalyze action in other online communities. One of these was debates with deadlines. So when friction happened over that one paragraph in the guidelines, the disagreement quickly turned into a heated debate that completely derailed the discussion about the guidelines. And here our role was a sort of a moderator role. Um, we suggested a deadline that gave members um, who were involved in the discussion a reason to find common ground. So I stepped into the forum and I said, um, we've spent so much time and energy on this. We need a last effort to reach consensus and we need your help for that to happen. Do you think setting a deadline would help? Um, and one side of the argument said, I do agree we should wrap things up soon if possible without unnecessary sacrifices. Some of the other labors of action that we came up with was one was act and undo, which was when no one was doing anything or there were disagreements, we would step in and take some action but leave space for objections and undoing our action if necessary. And there are more in the paper that I encourage you to read if you're interested in it. So this labor of action was basically structured mechanisms that helped um, these efforts. But did they actually help these efforts succeed? I'll talk about two of the efforts that did on the platform. So after over about a month of work, um, Turkers finally published the guidelines on September 7th, Labor Day 2014. They're available online as a 23-page write-up, um, this URL that covers things like fair payment and respecting Turker privacy. It has 261 six signatures by researchers and Turkers. We've seen people reference it in tasks and research papers. Um, the two of the institutions that I've been up in that I know of, uh, Stanford and Berkeley's institutional review boards require um, uh, compliance with the guidelines for researchers at those institutions. Another group on Dynamo started a collective effort to show the world who Turkers are written from their own perspective. And they did this through an open letter writing campaign to Jeff Bezos, Amazon CEO. The goal for this was in response to a lot of um, the media narrative at the time that talked about Turkers as sort of unskilled labor or a digital sweatshop that people would get really upset about because they felt like it misrepresented them. Um, and so they wanted to write their own narratives. Um, 30 people posted their letters publicly that you can read at this URL if you want to. And it was covered by major news outlets, including The Guardian and The Daily Beast. Um, since then, Turkers have actually gotten action on two of the things that they had asked for in their letters, um, including direct payment to Indian Turkers. So to conclude, Dynamo was about how structured labor, what we call the labor of action, can help these movements overcome the challenges of stalling and friction and move forward. 
And what's central in the fact um, about labor of action is that it couldn't be written into software because it required contextual knowledge and familiarity with the members of the public and their goals. A lot of these actions that we took were actually also risky. Um, so they required some kind of identified trustworthy actor to do them. And this challenges the idea that social software or social um, technical infrastructure by itself can produce the conditions for social change. And instead encourages us to think about centering the laborers that um, combined with software can actually work towards um, bringing about social change and how can we build tools or technology that better support those labors. So I described two systems that I've designed, deployed, um, and uh, studied, and I'm gonna end by talking about a project that I'm working on right now, um, which is about what should we do when people actively harm each other online. And I'm gonna talk about this project as a practice of speculative design into Twitter's future. So if you think about how, uh, oh, sorry, this is a project uh, together with Anna Gibson, Amy Hassanoff, and Danny Spitzberg. So if you think about how platforms approach harmful content right now, it's sort of this metaphor of there's a sea of content, and within the sea of content, there are certain ones that are toxic, um, and this is actually the word that Twitter uses to describe it. Um, and what the goal of moderation is, is to pick out the ones that are toxic as objectively as possible. And if we do that, we're gonna have a more healthy conversation. So let's assume that all of these goals are actually achieved. Meaning we have an objective, automated way to enforce all of the rules about what content is allowed. And there's no human bias in it. In fact, it's a bot. It's called ModBot. And ModBot is a super advanced AI. It's trained on billions of moderation decisions. It knows all of the rules for what content is not allowed and it enforces them. It also treats all content equally because it's a bot. So you give it content, it tells you whether it's against the rules or not. Now the designers of ModBot were actually very forward thinking. So they knew that the rules are gonna constantly change and what means harm is gonna constantly change. So ModBot is actually constantly learning. Um, it, it's been giving new data and it learns all the new rules. So in an alternative world, so in one world, moderation is done solely through ModBot. In an alternative world, our goal with dealing with online harm is based on ideas of justice. So restorative justice is actually one thing that we're, we're discussing heavily here. And it's sort of a philosophy and a practice of justice that helps us imagine alternatives here. Restorative justice has its roots in indigenous practice. Um, it's further developed by people in the prison abolition movement to offer an alternative to the carceral system. So much like content moderation, uh, the content moderation metaphor of sort of finding the toxic contents and removing them, um, a lot of the carceral system is based on the same idea of finding the toxic people in a community and removing them. So restorative justice offers an alternative to that and we thought what if we could use that as a basis for um, designing alternatives for moderation online. So restorative justice centers survivors of harm and prescribes a process of engaging community members to understand what a survivor's needs are, how those needs might be met, and how community norms can be transformed to prevent the continuation of acts of harm. And actually there's a, another sort of type of justice which is slightly different, a transformative justice is a closely aligned philosophy of justice which focuses more actually on community norms and systemic problems and asks how those might be transformed. So if the reason why a specific act of harm is constantly happen happening, maybe there's an underlying reason. Could be something as complex as racism. And so transformative justice asks us to think more about what the structural problems are that enable harm to happen and how can the community come together to deal with those um, problems and transform itself. So we did a project where we did participatory design with restorative and transformative justice practitioners and activists together with content moderators, um, mostly from Reddit. And we did interviews with these people and we held three online workshops where we presented these people with different scenarios of online harm and we asked them to think about if they were in a position of moderation and they had unlimited access to different kinds of resources, how would they deal with those? 
And I'm going to present two of those scenarios today to give you an example of the different ways that we can actually engage with online harm. So what came out of um, our participatory design process was a, a platform, an alternative vision for the future of Twitter, what I'm right now going to call Good Twitter. And Good Twitter has paid moderators that are trained in restorative justice. And it's based on these five values or principles. Um, the first one is that it acknowledges that people are embedded in communities, so it doesn't treat people as individual accounts. It establishes justice as a foundational value or what all acts should be working towards. It centers survivors and their narratives. Um, it assumes good faith but escalates in cases of harm. And it uses conversation as a primary tool for action. So we have two alternative visions for the future. Uh, we have ModBot and we have Good Twitter. And here's one of the scenarios that we use in our participatory design workshops. So this is actually a real world scenario that we found on the internet. It was about um, a case of um, uh, someone who had been an intern at a dentist uh, Flor in Florida and um, they had actually ended up dating that dentist. Then um, later on they had broken up and um, there were some uh, personal photos of them that this person had put on the internet. Later on, this person actually sends this message to the moderators of a Florida dentistry group saying, I have been a member of Florida Dentist for many years, and I don't want to leave the group. But a few weeks ago, he showed up as a new member. He hasn't tried to contact me in the group or posted my photos there or anything. But just knowing he is here makes me feel helpless and tormented all over again. I'm worried that he'll contact people in the group and share the photos with them. I don't feel safe in this community. I'm writing to ask if you could remove him from this group. So this is a real world case that happened. Now what, in the future, if ModBot was what, who was moderating this online space, what would ModBot do? Nothing. There is no toxic content, so there's nothing for ModBot to do. But what about good Twitter? So we had the people who were participating in these workshops actually think through how they would deal with this scenario. The first thing that they said was that they would give, provide access to resources on revenge porn for this person who was dealing with this problem. And um, there was a huge backstory to this problem. This person had gone to the police and they hadn't been able to help her, so they wanted to give her more access to resources and organizations that might be able to. They, they talked a lot about speaking to the survivor and laying out options for her. So even though she had said that she wants this person removed, um, a lot of people talked about things like the potential for retaliation um, and other things that they could do to maybe limit the potential for harm without necessarily um, escalating things further that could actually harm her even more. And they talked about whether there's an ethics committee um, and what are the different ways for people to think um, about um, ethics in this sort of, in the, in the Florida dentist community, which is a real world established community. So is there a process for a formal investigation? Should there be one? Um, and finally, how can we educate the community so that if the photos do get shared, what can they do about it? How are they supposed to react? So these are some potential paths forward um, that good Twitter might want to take. The second scenario, also a real world scenario, is about a journalist, um, we can call them at Green Notebook here, who wrote a story, um, at Green Notebook is also Jewish and was the target of a harassment campaign after a story that they wrote. So one of the things that happened was that by the end of the day that the story had been published, um, this person received hundreds of direct messages from random accounts on Twitter that were all pictures of ovens. Now, this person recognized the underlying threat, um, and what worried him even more was that he wasn't sure what was going on. This was definitely a coordinated attack, but they didn't know how many other people were there, where were they coordinating, and what was coming next. The goal of the whole effort was clearly to silence him. But let's think through it. If ModBot was the moderator of this space, what would happen? Nothing. Um, this, this is actually a real world scenario that happened on Twitter. The person did um, 
actually report all of the pictures of ovens to Twitter's trust and safety team, they all came back with, this is not against the rules. Um, pictures are, of ovens are not considered to toxic content by themselves. But actually what matters here is the context of the harm that's happening and what it means in that specific scenario. So again, in the good Twitter world, people talked about, again, providing access to resources to the survivor. Um, one of the things that kept coming up a lot was that is there a semblance of shared community here? So people cared a lot about whether the harm was happening within something that you could think of as a community. So are these identified actors or are they spam accounts or random um, strangers who are doing this? And their approach to them, to the problem, differed a lot based on this. So when there was a semblance of community, it was more about engaging in conversation. When it seemed like an outside attack by anonymous people, it was more about protection, getting access to that person. Uh, some people talked about making changes to the design of the platform so that these things could, wouldn't be so easy to happen. So should we make creating a new account harder? Or should, all mod should moderation treat all different kinds of accounts the same, ones that have been around for a really long time and have lots of activity versus accounts that were clearly just created and have just been engaging in this harassment? Um, and some other frameworks that we're building on in this work is transformative justice, which I mentioned is concerned with root causes and comprehensive outcomes. Community accountability is another process. These are all well-established processes that have um, different kinds of tools and ways of going about dealing with harm. Um, and we're trying to, and in this project, we're looking more into how can those lessons and those values be transferred into the ways that online communities deal with harm. So in this talk, I argued that to support collective action, we want to design social computing systems that center trust, familiarity, and accountability. And what I basically tried to do was refocus our attention from abstract content to people and their relations. So with Hive, I talked about, let's instead of focusing on abstract ideas as sort of the thing that's important, to thinking about people and their relations and their conversations. With Dynamo, we sort of shifted in thinking about design for collective action from thinking about the proposals as being the central thing to thinking about the human labor of organizing as being a central thing. And with Good Twitter, we talked about moving from thinking about specific pieces of abstract content that are toxic or not to thinking about human relations and justice and accountability and how the, those might be achieved. So through all of this work, I demonstrated that human labor, computational, method, computational models, and theories of justice and accountability are all important parts of socio-technical system design. Um, I want to thank all my collaborators in this work, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.